I remember 10 years ago when we got our first like celebrity client and I was like, oh my gosh, like this person, if you just saw them from, you know, from afar, just looking at their movies and they're on the red carpet and just, you know, images of them on, oh, in magazines at that point, because social media wasn't big, but you would think like, oh my gosh, this person would never have any trouble meeting men or, oh my gosh, this person, like they can get whatever guy that they want. They probably are approached all the time, but that's not the case. Welcome to the Asian Dating Podcast. Today, I have a very special guest. As you all know, my name is May Bugenhagen. I am with Two Asian Matchmakers, and I help single women just like you go from frustrated with dating to having a positive, unfair advantage dating strategy, no matter how experienced or inexperienced you are. And I also help men of all ethnicities who want to date Asian women and get one to two dates a month without getting rejected online or wasting time. So today we're going to talk a little bit about dating, of course. And I have a very special guest, Alessandra Conti, who is a celebrity matchmaker. She is co-founder of Matchmakers in the City, an old school personal matchmaking firm headquartered in Beverly Hills. Ali is the celebrity matchmaker for shows like NBC's Access Hollywood, CBS's Face the Truth, and was a matchmaker behind two seasons of MTV's Are You the One? Welcome to the show. I'm going to call you Ali. I know you as Ali. So how are you doing today? No, thank you so much, May. It's I'm doing great. It's so fun to be chatting with you. And yes, please call me Ali. I feel like when Alessandra Conti is like my celebrity matchmaker, Alessandra Conti name, and I'm like, yes. But yeah, Ali is perfection. Okay, good, good. I know you're in Beverly Hills, and obviously you are a celebrity matchmaker. And I've actually not had anyone on the show talk about celebrity matchmaking. So how did you get into this world of celebrities and setting them up? And how did you get started? Tell us a little bit about you. Yes, absolutely. So yeah, I mean, I think May, how long have we known each other at this point? I say 14 years or 13 yeah. years. It's been a while. That, yeah. That's crazy. Um, That's absolutely crazy. Yeah. Because I think we met you like very early yeah. on. Um, But yeah, back to just kind of how origins. So myself and my sister, Um, it's now been a decade. So it can't be longer than 10 years. It's like probably 10 years I've known you, May. Okay. Um, okay. But I'll take the 14. <laughs> like that. But yeah, so um, about, it's been now a little over 10 years, myself and my sister were, we just, we always set up our friends for fun. Um, I mean, through growing up, I think like most matchmakers, it was just what we did. And we were from a small town right outside of New York City where there was very little to do. So we would just constantly, like for every major event, we would set up our friends. And whether it be at like at the bar mitzvahs where the boys were on one side, the girls were on the other, or the prom, when prom came around, we were matchmaking everybody if somebody did didn't have a date, they would be like, oh my gosh. Like we were like, oh, no worries. We got you. But anyway, Christina, then we went on to college. Christina went to Oxford and got her master's and I was just finishing up undergrad. Um, L Christina's older than me, um, even though she literally does not have a wrinkle, not a wrinkle. She doesn't do anything. I do everything. And I have even, I'm like, ah, and Christina, not a wrinkle in sight, but Christina was graduating with her master's and I was doing, I finished undergrad at in DC at American. And we would just always talk about how fun would it be to move to LA and start a matchmaking company? Like it just was like in our soul and we would just kind of joke around about it. But then as we were there, we were like, like at the end of our schooling, we were like, let's just do it. Let's move to LA. We knew nothing about LA. The only thing that we knew about LA was from what we had seen on TV in movies, specifically from the TV show, The Hills. Remember The Hills, May, the back with like, yeah. So we, we did it and we hopped off the plane at LAX with a dream and a cardigan. Thank you, Miley. And we, yeah, we hit the ground running and we moved to the apartment complex that 
the girls from the Hills lived in on the first season. So it just kind of, we were just kind of thrust into like the young Hollywood scene, literally from going to the pool and just sunbathing, meeting people. And we like created our business plan and everything poolside. It was, it was such a, like, we were in a, in this like luxury apartment, but we were in this little one bedroom with two twin beds, but it was great because we were right in like the heartbeat of LA. But anyway, okay. I'm, I feel like I'm tangenting, but all that to say, one of my girlfriends then was in PR. So she would invite us to different parties. And that was how like the whole celebrity matchmaking, the, we started just going to all these different parties and red carpet events and all of that. And just meeting people who were either in the entertainment industry or adjacent, which is very LA. So that's how the kind of celebrity matchmaking element came about. But we started the company and we don't only do celebrities. I specialize in working with celebrities, but we do a lot of like professionals who are rocking at their careers, but dating is just really, it's, it's, it's a challenge, but yeah. So we started then just us doing everything in a little office in Beverly Hills. And now we've grown and we have now a team of seven matchmakers. Um, and we're still based in Beverly Hills. We're back to Beverly Hills after all these years, but yeah. So that's kind of the long story. I love it because it really shows that people who start matchmaking companies like you, your sister, me, We didn't go to school to think we're going to come out and help people change their lives and to find the one or a long-term partner for somebody. It just kind of evolves with A, your personality, and two, your passion, and three, what you can do to be excited about work every day, right? Because I was just telling um, somebody the other day that I'm actually addicted to work. Like I love working. I don't I just want to work all the time and I have fun doing it, whether it's creating content, doing a podcast, matching people, interviewing somebody like it just, you almost have to be kind of an extrovert to really get into this business and be good at it. And I mean, I'm training other Asia matchmakers to be matchmakers in this industry because I want more of them out there that I can network with. So as far as you having seven employees, I mean, you're training them all the time, right? I mean, it's not like they just get hired and then you're like, do your thing. It's like, it's an ongoing process. So you're wearing a lot of different hats. Well, I will say, May, that we kind of learned the hard way um, when it comes to hiring matchmakers. So when we had first started, we didn't quite understand how special it was to be a matchmaker and to actually be a good matchmaker. Mm -hmm. Um, Because like you said, you need to have, like you need to be an extrovert. You need to be also very professional. You need to be incredibly reliable. You need to be empathetic, but you need to be able to have thick skin. Um, So it's, it's, beyond what any normal job, you need to be a therapist. You need to be a best friend. You need to be a shoulder to cry on. You need to be able to take a lot of bizarre abuse that literally has nothing to do with you and has everything to do with somebody's general frustration. Um, so we learned the hard way, um, when it came to hiring, um, when we had first started, and it was just me and Christina, we, we, we recognized that it was not sustainable to do everything just ourselves. It just wasn't. Um, I also know my strengths and I know my weaknesses. Um, I don't know about you, but I am so emotional and I have like really thin skin and I feel like you don't like, do you, are you, do you have thin skin or do you have really thick skin? You like I have take- pretty, I have pretty thick skin because I've been in sales for a long time and I try not to take things personally. And I really have grown in just kind of figuring out why people are the way they are and just find a way to talk to them in a way that kind of diffuses the situation. I think that's probably the key is that, I guess, but no, I, I, I feel like I'm also kind of guarded too when I talk to people. So I'm not, all my emotions aren't out there displayed for everyone to see or feel or 
you know, no, but, but I get what you're saying. Um, I think maybe I had a little bit thin skin when I first started, but now it's like, I've seen it all. I've seen it all. I've heard it all. I'm sure you have too. So yeah, I definitely, I've seen it all and I've heard it all. I I agree. But for some reason, I'm just still so affected. Like I'm so affected and I, I do get very emotionally invested with everybody that we're working with, but that's why it's so important for somebody like me to have a team yeah. that is able to put that boundary up and is able to handle, you know, the, the criticism of, of matches and it's not a personal criticism and it's, it, but anyway, like I was saying, yeah, we definitely learned the hard way because we initially were like, oh, we can just hire these like young, um, you know, right out of college party girls who can just be matchmakers and we'll, you know, they'll go out. We know they can recruit, they can talk to clients, they can do this, they can do that. And we learned really quickly that, and we would train them. We would pour hours and hours and hours into training them but it, yeah, we learned really quickly that matchmaking is so much more than just being a social butterfly and, um, yeah. And being a party girl, it's, it's a true, it's a combination of a gift, but also it's like, it, it has, it's a psych psychology. It's like all of these different elements that, um, have to come together to create a really great matchmaker. So now the team of matchmakers that we have are all like, they come from different companies. So they all have years of experience, years and years of experience. Um, if we were to hire again, we would not just hire somebody that doesn't, you know what I mean? Like just to train somebody, we, we don't, we don't do that anymore because we've just seen it crash and burn. Unfortunately, I wish that wasn't the case, but yeah, it has to be with us. It's like, are you a seasoned matchmaker? Great. Um, with Anthony, we lucked out because he came to us as an intern. So he really, he started with us and he's just so he's very diligent and he's great with like admin and all of that. And, um, and he's learning definitely, but yeah, I mean with Liat and Liat, oh my gosh, the best matchmaker ever, you know, Karina is one of our matchmakers. She is just next level incredible. And she just really gets it. Um, JD comes from another matchmaking company as well. So we're, we're that's our, that's, that's what we've learned. Um, and they all handle, you know, the really kind of tough stuff. Yeah. Whereas I just can't, I'm like, you guys, you ladies know I can't handle it. Please, please. Yeah. I think also maturity plays a key <laughs> role in yeah. being a celebrity matchmaker, right? Like you have to know how to speak to celebrities and kind of figure out what they want and how to find that person for them. Like, I know you can't say any names of the celebrities, but what what are some differences between working with celebrities and working with, you know, regular people like you and me? Yeah, I find that. Um, so, yeah, I think the way that the structure of our company works is that a majority of our clients are working professionals. Um, but then we do have a, a number of celebrities, public figures, like very high profile people, and they are working one on one with myself. So like I am their personal matchmaker, like they have my like we are texting throughout the day. It's a different experience. I find that with a lot of every person is different. But I definitely find that with a lot of, you know, the, the real, you know, A-list clients, they need a lot more handholding. They need a lot more just attention. It's love is the great equalizer. So it's, it's so mind boggling. I mean, I remember 10 years ago when we got our first like celebrity client and I was like, oh my gosh, like this person if you just saw them in the, from, you know, from afar, just looking at their movies and they're on the red carpet and just, you know, images of them on, on, um, you know, in magazines at that point, because social media wasn't big, but you would think like, oh my gosh, this person would never have any trouble meeting men or, oh my gosh, this person, like they can get whatever guy that they want. They probably are approached all the time, but that's not the case. You know, it's, it's so not the case, especially for, I think, celebrity women, 
they have that struggle that, you know, uh, uh, they're just either their DMs are filled with, um, you know, just creepy guys. And they, they're like, what? No, there's no way I would, you know, they're never going to meet somebody in that way. Or they go out and, you know, they're very untouchable. Whereas with the celebrity male clients, I really love working. I think a lot of matchmakers love working with the men. It just tends to be a bit, not easier because it's not easier, but it's a bit less emotionally traumatizing, if that makes sense. (laughs) I'm using the word traumatizing. I know, I guess for me, I, not traumatizing, but I think it's just a little less, you know, it's they're they're emotional definitely, but I don't know. I, I think they're a bit, um, I, I just, I do really enjoy working with the male celebrity clients, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's very different in that a lot of times, especially like right now I'm working with one client who is like a, a major like household name and he can't come to the office, even though we have like underground parking and we got it for a reason. So they don't have, they can literally pull in underground, come up, nobody sees them or anything like that. But, uh, even, but like with him, the paparazzi hound him. So like, I have to go to his home for meetings. Like there's just no way around it. So I go to his home for meetings, which is also so fun. Cause you know, there's that. So nice. when you're matching these celebrities, like this celebrity male client, are you just finding other female celebrity women for him? Or he's wants to date regular non-celebrities? So it really depends. And it's kind of a combination. I like to typically, um, I'm a big believer that in every relationship, there's a diamond and there's a setting. So I think a lot of times the public figure or celebrity in the relationship is the diamond and they need a strong setting. Um, Even though they're attracted to other diamonds, it typically clashes. So I really like to do a combination of matches. Um, So like for this particular, uh, for this particular client, I, I've matched him with, you know, a a very well-known, you know, actress Mm -hmm. as well. And then I'm working on another match with another really big name actress as well, but I'm, I'm working with her dating coach right now. And so hopefully that hopefully it pans out, but also in the matchmaking community, there are a few matchmakers like Bonnie Winston. So Bonnie and I collaborate a lot because she works with a lot of celebrities as well. So we're able to be like, I'm like, okay, Bonnie, I'm working with, you know, this guy. And she's like, oh my gosh, I'm working with this woman. Like, let's try it. And we're like, yes, that sounds great. So it's, it's fun in that respect, but so it is a combination. Um, it, it definitely is a combination, but I think it does, it does take a very, um, specific personality type to be able to handle, especially the level of fame and honestly, isolation that a lot of, um, a lot of true, you know, A-list celebrities are experiencing because it is an isolating existence. Like they have all the money in the world, but they're, they're really cut off from society because they're, you know, any move that they make is scrutinized. So yeah, I've, I've developed like a strong level of empathy for just, you know, the isolation that a lot of people like really in the public eye face, you know, the, the C and D listers, they're great. They like have the best time of it because they love the attention. It's like, it's not that aggressive, but I think there hits a certain level where it becomes like really isolating. Um, and that's, that's really challenging. And I, I love working with that level as well, because I can kind of be like a really safe place for them to, you know, to just like, I, I can be like, Hey, like I'm in the real world you're doing great. Like everything you're experiencing is normal. Okay. Cause they're like, what's wrong with me? Why am I feeling this way? Like it's normal. Okay. Like I'm like, hello, you're fine. You're fine. You're experiencing normal dating things. This is not weird. You're not, you know, you're fine. So for a listener out there listening, they're wondering how much do celebrities pay for matchmaking? Like what are your celebrity matchmaking packages and are they same for regular people or different for celebrities. Yeah, it is different um, because it is working one-on-one with myself. So my rates begin at 50,000 and it's for six months and then they go up from there. So it begins at that. um, And then it, yeah, it goes up from there, but 
Um, but yeah, and our normal packages are, you know, our, our normal packages are a lot more affordable for like working professionals and they work with the team of matchmakers and I'm still involved in those memberships, but I'm not the point person that is like, you know, I'm just, I can't, I physically can't be, but yeah, so that's the pricing for if somebody is at a at a different level. But yeah, the other packages though, we have like membership, we have basic membership, like to be in our database is a hundred dollars. And then we have memberships beginning at $10,000. They go, you know, all the way up to 50 and 90 and whatever. Like it's, it's a big range. It's a big range, but yeah, when they're like, you know. So would you say that you prefer working with female clients or male clients, or does it matter as long as they're a good candidate for matchmaking? So, I mean, I personally, I've found that I have to really, really like the client um, because it's not worth it, even though it sounds like, oh my gosh, that's such a great amount of money. If you don't, like, if you're working with a horrible, miserable person, right, May, like, have you learned this over the years that no amount of money, like no amount of money is worth it if they're just a horrible person. And if you don't connect with them, do you feel the same way? Well, yeah. I mean, the whole point of being self-employed is so I don't have to stress out about just anybody I take on. I only take on eight to 12 guys and I take on male paying clients only and the female women join my database for free. So that's my business model. And I enjoy that uh, eight to 12 guys at a time. Even 12 guys is a lot. I just like, you know, cruising at like, eight or nine guys at a time. Cause then I could give them a lot of attention. I can really focus on screening the women for them and also networking with other matchmakers like yourself for yeah. the men. So it's like, I'm their personal recruiter, right? I'm just, yeah. Casting a wider net and helping them. So yeah, yeah. I, I used to work with female clients and um, I find that the minute that a woman pays you a dime, they expect everything. Like all of a sudden they were open to dating a guy who was five, six in my database and sending them on a lot of dates. And then they pay you and all of a sudden they want a guy who's six. Oh, and I'm like, wait, but the reason why I took you on was because you were open-minded. But now that I took your money, you're not open-minded anymore. And I just, I don't have any problems with saying no to that. Cause I don't, I don't want the stress. I mean, come on, I've been doing this 15 years. I don't want to stress out and wake up and, you know, look in the mirror and be like, oh, I have to like get stressed out over this client. No. Yeah. Bless. Like that <laughs> is beautiful, May. It's so true. I mean, we definitely, we, we work with like female clients in, in both areas and yeah. at, in matchmakers in the city and um, and you know, it, it, and my uh, one-on-one with me too, but yeah, I mean, I will, I completely agree with you. And even now we're, we're kind of dealing, I feel like every, there's always some kind of situation like that, where, you know, we sign them on. We're so excited because we're like, oh my gosh, like, yeah, yeah she, okay. She wants a Christian guy. Amazing. We can totally do that. And it's all about values. It's about lifestyle. It's about, you know, the, the internal qualities, but then it's like, we literally have have at, we yeah i mean i have so many bizarre like change of face stories and karina will have done the interview the initial best match interview personality assessment in this room actually this is where all the magic happens where we do like interview uh an in, intake like kind of initial best match interview personality assessments and you know karina takes incredible notes like she da, 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 da. so we'll be like oh well I'll read it we'll be like oh wonderful da, 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 da. and then you know we'll present the first match to the bachelorette and then all of a sudden where her age range was up to 45 now it's how dare you set me up with a 45 I specifically said 39 and blah, blah, blah. and we're like wait what like that and then Karina's like no I I literally have it on tape okay yeah. and then you know it's so anyway, yeah, it is definitely like female clients are very challenging. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, so yes, I, I agree. I agree. Um, I think that for me, like, I think in the kind of celebrity, um, uh, what, what should we call it? The celebrity arm of matchmakers in the city. 
it, I, I enjoy both. Like I like to work with, but I, but I've also learned that I do have to really love the person and really believe that I, that I'm the matchmaker that can make it happen for them because otherwise I would much rather refer them if, if there's just, if there's something not aligning, if I'm not really connecting with them because they're ultimately, I'm going to be communicating with them a whole lot over, you know, over the time together. Right. Right. Yeah. So aside from celebrity matchmaking, you talk a little bit about masculine energy and feminine energy in some of your podcasts and I'm sure your work and stuff like that. So talk to me a little bit about that. What are your thoughts on women who exude masculine energy or men who exude feminine energy or vice versa? Yeah. I mean, I think that I, I've, you know, over the last, you know, over 10 years, I've really just seen how um, a lot of very powerful, very successful women come in and they're like, listen, I am, you know, I work, I'm, they're essentially saying I'm in my masculine when I'm at work. When I come home, I really want to, you know, Re, I want to be in that feminine energy and in, in that feminine space, um, that kind of warm, nurturing, loving, you know, like relaxed, receiving energy, as opposed to the doing, you know, achieving, you know, working like that, that, that energy would be considered quote unquote masculine and, and feminine. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I remember at just having heard this over and over and over again and, and kind of then uh, then then teaching women to really just relax let the man lead when they go on dates and you know be affirming and be kind and you know be playful and compliment and flirt and just have fun like that's i i, I then you know now it's become these buzzwords of masculine energy and feminine energy and i'm really grateful to have a anchor i'm i'm happy to have verbiage where i can um where I can, I can express it in that way, but I, I just want to affirm the, this kind of new resurgence of, of verbiage and, and affirm it and say like, yeah, I've seen this over so many years that, you know, women tend to really thrive when they can be in that softer receiving space when they're dating. Um, and then that then allows if, and this is in heterosexual relationships and I'm not knocking women who, you know, are, have more of that masculine energy and they don't enjoy being in that feminine space. That's fine. It's just, it's not for you. You know what I mean? It's, this would not be the advice, but if there's a woman that is like, wow, I'm absolutely utterly exhausted. I feel like I do everything at home at work. I'm, I'm constant. I'm nonstop. I'm always in this activated space. And so I, I found it really helpful to work with women to get back to their, you know, their soft um, receiving energy. What are some tips you would give women who are excelling and accomplished in their field and they boss men around and they're a leader in their positions and they're an executive? Like, how would you have them? switch when they go on a date? Like, are there some things that they can do to automatically flip the switch and be more feminine? Switch back into that, like that organic feminine energy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that for women who are like that, I, I call it vacation dating and this vacation dating mindset. So it's literally putting your out of office on, like if you're going on a date, put your out of office on your email and you are out of office. Um, there create a playlist of the songs that make you feel just like your songs. Like you were in that fun, fabulous space that you're just like, yes, 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 yes. It could be Taylor Swift. It could be Drake. It could be, you know, heavy metal, whatever that is, that that music is that gets you into that fun space and that, that like relaxed space. Um, that's what, that's the goal. Um, so that when they head into their dates, they can literally, when they're ordering their Uber, it's like, get into that mindset of, 
I'm on vacation. Like I'm going on vacation. Um, and even before they order the Uber, I mean, I think that for women it's, you know, getting just really adorning their bodies in like looking fabulous. And, you know, I, it, 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 it's different for everybody. Right. So some women, you know, I, I think dresses are fabulous and I think little black dress, nude heels, you can't go wrong on a first date. Um, but you know, doing like putting on your favorite dress and wearing those clothing, putting on your favorite pair of heels, doing your hair, doing your makeup, just getting into that. And yes, it is stereotypical, but there's a reason for it because when we do all of that, it does, it's something shifts in us. And we, when we look good, we feel good. And I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. I think that that's a fabulous space to be in, you know, um, and obviously if it's a woman that's like, I, I only wear pants and I hate heels. Okay. This is not the advice for you, but if it's a woman that's like, oh my gosh, like that sounds like so much fun. Do it girl. Like take that time and do your hair, do your makeup, really sit and listen to that music, do vacation mode on when you are going on your dates. And then when you get on the dates, just allowing the man to lead, let him lead three words that I always say, let him lead, um, and use words like, oh my gosh, thank you. You're such a gentleman. So really inviting those traditional gender roles back into the dating experience, because I think that men, men really do enjoy, you know, being the protector and being the provider. And there's something that clicks in them that I call the Prince Charming switch, where when they see that, oh, this woman is so grateful for this, you know, the fact that I'm holding the door for her, the fact that I'm, you know, um, and that I'm making sure that, you know, that the date is that I'm in charge of the date, that I'm planning the date, that I'm booking the location and that I'm, you know, all of that. When a woman affirms that, what are your thoughts on this, May? I'm fascinated to hear because I know my thoughts on it, but what are your thoughts? Same thing. I just feel like sometimes women get so caught up in what they do, what they are at work that sometimes when they're saying, well, the guy should just love me and like me for who I am. It's like, no, he's probably not going to on the first date, like you not wearing makeup, not doing your hair, not being feminine, not saying thank you, not flirting, like let him love you for who you are on the fifth or sixth date, like be your true self, true, true, true self on fifth or sixth date. But the first four dates, you should be on your best behavior, right? Like, don't you want to look your best? Don't you want to put your best foot forward, even in a job interview? And we say dates aren't job interviews, but they kind of are interviews. They kind of are interviews where they want to see if you are potentially the person that they could be with on a second date. You know, the whole goal of a first date is to get to a second date. And I agree with all those things that you said. Um, thinking back on my dating experience when I was in my twenties, like, yeah, I would go from a corporate job wearing a suit, suit jacket and go on a date. Cause I didn't have time to change at home. And I'm like, wow, that was such a bad thing to do. Right. Like I didn't take the time to go home and change or look feminine or wear some cute earrings or whatever that may be, but little things like that, you only get one chance to make a good first impression so why not do that? So I agree with all those things you said, like you just have to let the man lead and it's okay if he wants to open the door for you. You're not going to make a snide comment if he opens the door for you. It's like, just say thank you. Like there's nothing wrong with that. Um, just little things like that. If the guy wants to pay, do you want to do a fake purse reach? Maybe you do, maybe you don't, but it's okay just to say thank you for the drinks or thank you for dinner. It was really lovely. I had a great time. You know, like sometimes we forget to say thank you. It's just little things like that. It's okay that you absorb it and take it and be a woman, be feminine. So he can picture himself with you like, okay, she appreciates me. You know, she said, thank you. She appreciates the dinner I bought her. She appreciates the fact that I paid for her valet or whatever that may be. So yeah, it's like, let the man be a man. I, I'm totally all for those traditional 
behaviors. I mean, as an Asian woman and Asian dating and all that, like Asian women like that. They like to help their man and support their man and cook for him and do things for him and all that stuff. Yeah. It's, it's so fascinating because I feel like I, like, I I feel like I I'm very integrated in the just kind of dialogue surrounding gender roles and like, you know, in LA, it's a very progressive place. And I, I very much respect the theory behind all of it. I do. I really respect it, but I respectfully disagree, um, with a lot of the, a lot of what's being, um, what's being kind of screamed at, at, our society and, and the, you know, the, the Gen Zers. Um, and I'm so glad that I think that there's such a pendulum right now because there are, you know, there are a lot of things that don't naturally feel like they align. Um, and so I think that that's why there's now a louder voice of that, you know, high value woman, high value man, the masculine, you know, the buzzwords, the masculine energy, feminine energy. I think that there is this, this kind of strong resistance in a way to what a lot of like a lot, a lot of, you know, um, a lot of the modern culture is trying to say like, no, 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 like, da, 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 like split the bill, like, da, 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 like, no, you can, you plan the day girl, you plan the day. Like, no, it's just, it's, it's throwing it's, it's in theory, beautiful. Wow. I love that theory. I'm, I love that. But in practice, it's just not it's not, it doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And I also think that a lot of women, um, a lot of really strong women tend to like these hyper, hyper toxic masculine men, because those hyper toxic masculine men, they don't give these women a chance to be in their masculine. They're like, no, 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 you know, but that's like toxic masculinity. So that's why it's really important for these women that are the boss babes that are rocking it at their careers to really get reacquaint themselves with their bodies, their femininity. Um, join. I also am a big believer. I, I have a women's group. We meet every Tuesday. It's like not, it's a nonprofit. Like it's, you know what I mean? It's, it's not a real nonprofit, but like it's not for profit, but I'm in that I'm in junior league, which is like a female based organization. So I love surrounding myself with other feminine energy, because I think that you do like when women kind of are in community together, we remember, you know, we, we are, we're, it's, it's a force and it's this beautiful, it's this beautiful learning from each other. Um, so I, that's something else that I would truly recommend so that when, when a woman then does go into the dating scene, she's able to come in her strong feminine energy, which exactly like, it's just so men melt, you know, and they don't have to be with this toxic masculine guy to put them in their feminine energy. They can be with a really great man that maybe isn't, you know, going to be like, rah, 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 put your foot down, blah, 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 blah. like, but if they, if they don't allow that guy, that really cool, good guy that has it in him, but he's not going to overtly, you know, but if they allow him to, he'll, it, they'll get better men. You know what I mean? Does that kind of make sense, May? Yeah. It just seems like sometimes, um, the really, really strong women, like you said, want an even a stronger guy, but I don't think that strong guy wants a strong woman like that. Like he's not looking for boardroom in the bedroom. He's looking for someone nice, kind, sweet. Yes. You can still be a CEO of a company and exude all these feminine qualities. So when you go on a date, you're not leading by telling him how many people you boss around at work. You're talking about your personal life. You're talking about your dog, your family, what you believe in, you're talking about church, you're talking about current events, like all those other things, but you're not leading by talking about your work and how high up you are and how much money you're making. Like those things are not what's going to drive a guy in your arms. Like that's not what the guys are looking for, at least not the guys I'm working with. The guys that I'm working with who hire me 
Yes, they're making great money, right? Otherwise, they can't afford matchmaking for ten, fifteen, twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars. But those guys are looking for just a nice person that he thinks that he could be around with, companionship, have a great intimacy relationship, and all this other stuff. Like you're not even giving him a chance if you're just trying to lead by all this masculine energy. So I I don't know how else to put it, but yeah. 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 The warm, the loving, the supportive, the, you know, the playful, that's what a majority of the male clients that we're working with, that's what they're looking for. And I think like, if women only knew this, that, and that's, that's like, I was working with one of our female clients. She's amazing. I just set her up with, um, one of my male celebrity clients, which was great. Um, cause she's a, she's definitely a boss woman, but she's also learning and we're doing coaching in just reminding her that when you're on dates, like it's okay to be in that feminine energy. It's okay to be warm. It's okay to give compliments. It's okay to be playful and to laugh and to giggle and to be a little silly. And that's beautiful. That's not only okay. That is that's, that's what they want. They want to be able to then put that guard down as well and put that armor down. Um, and I also think that a lot of times with, with men, they'll come onto a date with that, that armor on and women will see that armor and they'll be like, okay, well, this is my armor, but it should be the opposite. It's like when the, the guy, we have to just, oh, okay, he's going to come on with his armor. That's okay. It's his like, little testosterone armor. It's fine. Bless you. But like the woman comes in and like, oh, then the, the armor is like, oh, is it safe? Oh, okay, it's safe. It's safe. It's safe. Oh, we can have fun. And, you know, so yeah, it's just fascinating. It's fascinating. So, what would you say one uh, dating book that you would recommend for someone out there who's getting back into dating or want to be armed with some of these new tactics or tips? What would you recommend that they read? Is there a book that you like that you think or recommend to all of your clients? Yes, absolutely. Um, attached, I think is, is essential. It's essential reading for human beings in general, um, because it talks about attachment theory by Amir Levine. And I think Rachel something, um, but yes, attached, attached, attached. You need to know what your attachment style is. And you need to know what your partner's attachment style is because they may have, they may be, um, you know, acting in certain ways. And you're like, wait, why is, why are they acting like that? And you're like, always oh, anxious attachment style. And then you can just know that and you can affirm your partner and know that it's, it's not because they don't trust you. It's just, they have anxious attachment style and that's okay. Um, so yes, love attached. Think it's amazing. For women going through, like wanting to just re, you know, remember their femininity, the book, and I'm sorry, this is, it's a quote unquote bad word, but it's called Pussy. And it's so good. It's by like Mama Jean or something like that. I don't know. I'm in the middle of listening to it right now. When I get my lashes done, I listen to like all the books on tape and I'm, I'm in the midst of listening, but it's really about connecting to that feminine energy. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, and it's a little out there, but I think even if, even if a woman takes like a third of it, like, and injects it and just lets it be like, it, it's so helpful. It's so much fun. Cause it just reminds us like, it's so much fun to be a woman and we can celebrate it. And it's, you know, it's just, I think you said it all right there, being a woman celebrate it. And yeah, I love it. Allie, thank you so much for joining me today on the show. You were such a blast to talk to. I wish we could spend another hour together, but tell us, uh, tell the people how they can find you if they would like to work with you. And of course I will include all this information in the show notes, but any last parting tips and tell us how we can contact you. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, May. This is so much fun. Um, and yeah, I mean, like I said, we don't only work with celebrities, even though I personally specialize, but matchmakers in the city, just go and uh, go to matchmakers in the city.com, um, sign up for free to book in a consultation with one of the matchmakers. Um, so that's really the first step. Um, and then you can follow me at matchmaker Alessandra Conti. So at matchmaker and then A L E S S. And then the rest of me should pop 
pop up on Instagram. I'm mostly active on Instagram. I'm trying to get into TikTok, but it's like not really my thing. I know we need to make it our thing, but it is what it is. For now, I love Instagram. Um, but yeah, it was such a pleasure though, May. Thank you so much for having me. What's one last tip you can give uh, the listeners out there? Yes, flirt. I flirt. I'm a big believer that flirting can change the world. And if people were just more playful with one another, it would be like, like everything would be okay. If people were just more playful with each other. So when I say flirt, AKA be playful and, and enjoy connecting, just enjoy whatever that connection might be. Enjoy it, have fun with it and be playful. I love it. Thank you, Allie. And for listeners out there, if you're single, want to be set up in my database, please go to twoasianmatchmakers.com, fill out a profile, men and women. I would love to have you in my database and to set you up. And thank you very much. Bye, guys.